Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 10 and I'll be reading verses 25 through 37. And this is what it says. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among the robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went off leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite also, and when he came to the place, saw him passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robber's hands? And he said to him, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Go and do the same. Not think, not feel, not believe. Go and do the same. Let's pray. Jesus, this day... You're calling us to go and do, not just to think, not just to feel, not just to believe, to go and do. Jesus, we need your strength to go. We need your strength to do. And this morning, may we know the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Go and do. Go and do. Those are strong words. Go and do. I read a story about a fellow named Earl. Earl lived in the mountains of Tennessee. And Earl was known among all the people where he lived as a ne'er-do-well. That's what they called him. He was kind of a slacker. And he tried to get out of doing whatever he, it was that he was supposed to do. Well, when he received a draft notice to go into the army, he, that's not something he wanted to do. So he was going to try and convince, during his physical, try and convince the doctor that he was, had double vision. So when he went into the, for his physical, the doctor said, do you see the, the eye chart on the wall? Well, Earl turned around and said, yeah, but it's all blurry. The doctor said, well, you passed the test. Earl said, what do you mean I passed the test? I said, it was all blurry. The doctor said, yes, that was the hearing test. <laughs> Sometimes the test isn't what we think the test is going to be. 
Sometimes that we think the test is one thing, but the test is something entirely different. This morning, the story is about someone who wants to put Jesus to the test. Well, we can be assured that any time we want to put Jesus to the test, Jesus is not the one being tested. That it's us. That it's us. Well, this man who's trying to put Jesus to the test, he's a lawyer. And the lawyer turns to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, he's asking the right question. He's asking a question that's right on the target. Because Scripture, a case could be made that the main theme of Scripture is life. That Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know basically the difference between right and wrong. You don't need a relationship with God to know that murder is a bad thing. We know the difference between right and wrong. They did not eat from the tree of life. We don't know what life is apart from a relationship with God. And it's why Jesus came. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Not just live and breathe, but the kind of life that has the quality of eternity. The quality of life that's abundant, that we can't get on our own. Not just by living and breathing and doing the best we can. That it requires that relationship with God. So he asks Jesus to test Jesus. What must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus says, what does scripture say? Well, he quotes to him from scripture. He says, love the Lord. There's that relationship that I was talking about before. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, yes. You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. There's the answer to life again. That, do this. Love God, love neighbor, and yes, do this and you will live. Well, the guy's a lawyer. What do lawyers do? They look for loopholes. They look for exceptions. Well, certainly you can't mean love everyone. I mean, everybody is somebody's redneck. There must be a redneck out there that I don't have to love. You know, there's somebody... I, at least God's probably got an A list and a B list. And there's some people on God's B list I don't need to love. And who is my neighbor? That was his next question. So Jesus tells a story. I like the way that Matthew and Mark say, Jesus did not teach them anything without a story. Jesus told lots of stories. So Jesus tells this story story about him and he starts off the story he says and a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho well any story that starts with going from Jerusalem to Jericho you know it's going to be a story of high adventure you know it's going to be a story about bandits you know it's going to be a story about some a quick getaway or the one that didn't get away or something. it would be like me telling a story and I was traveling down highway 400 you'd know that if I mentioned 400 it had to include traffic probably people driving foolishly or an accident of some sort that, they knew what this story was going to be about by saying a certain man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and he goes on to say that he fell among the robbers now that's this man, that, that's the, the, the first group that he falls among. Robbers. Well, these robbers have the attitude, what's, what's yours is mine if I can take it. And that's, that's one of the very first of all of life's attitude. What's yours is mine if I can take it. Five of the Ten Commandments address this attitude. Your stuff is my stuff if I can take it. It's called stealing. Your life is mine if I can take it. It's called murder. Your wife is mine if I can take her. It's called adultery. Your good name, it's mine. Well, if I can besmirch it, if I can gossip, if I can, if I can bear false witness, your good name is mine if I can take it. And the last of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not covet. What in the world does coveting take from anyone? Coveting, 
case could be made that coveting, wanting what someone else has, that that is the introduction to all sin, to breaking all the Ten Commandments. It was Adam and Eve who looked at the fruit of the tree and saw that it was desirable to eat. They wanted it. That was all they needed, their want. That's where coveting starts. When the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 begins to talk about how sin enslaves us, he starts with coveting. The coveting starts with taking a gift not from other people, but taking from God. The gift of praise that's due him. The gift of gratitude that's due God. The gift of recognizing what all God has surrounded us with. And and it's covenanting that says that's not good enough. I want something somebody else has. It's coveting. Coveting that was the cause of the first murder. When Cain killed his brother Abel, he desired the blessing that his brother had. He wanted that blessing. Coveting isn't just a, a... a throwaway of the Ten Commandments, the case could be made that it's the start of breaking all the commandments. It's robbing God of the blessing that's due God. And it's the attitude that says, what's yours is mine, if I can take it. It's the attitude that that these robbers had for this man who was traveling on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Well, Jesus doesn't commend them. No, he keeps telling the story. He fell among the robbers and they beat him. And they left off, they, they went off leaving him half dead. And then it says, and by chance a certain priest was going down the road and then a Levite after him. Well, The priest and the Levite, their lives were consecrated to serving God, not just serving their own wants. It was the priest and the Levite that carry the attitude that their lives have a purpose to them. The priest, well, his life was set aside for sacrifice. Sacrifice, serving God through giving the sacrifices in the temple. All day long, that's what he did. Not just killing small animals, but the big animals, butchering. He was a, really a professional butcher is what he was doing. Every day, all day. But then the Levite, they also worked in the temple. Their, their lives were dedicated to serving God there in the temple of keeping the administration of the temple in the way that, that, that God had prescribed. And if they went to that man that was there by the road and he was dead, it would mean they wouldn't be able to serve in the temple until they went through ceremonial cleansing. The rules were clear. You couldn't touch something that was dead and just waltz into the presence of God. They wouldn't be able to spend their lives the way that their lives were consecrated. It's an attitude that says, what's mine is mine and I intend to keep it. My time is my time and I intend to use it the way I intend. My life is my life. Don't get in the way of the way I intend to lead my life. My things are my things, and I intend to hold on to them. What's mine is mine, and I intend to keep it. And a life that's dedicated to to holding on, to hanging on, is a life of management and control. And if you've tried to live a life of management and control, you know it's not much of a life at all. And Jesus doesn't commend them. Instead, he continues to tell the story. Tells a story about the Samaritan. Well, the minute that he mentions a Samaritan, it's got to have a reaction among the people who are listening there. This is in chapter 10. And 
the, the thing that happened just in chapter 9, at the very end of chapter 9, it's just a little bitty, little bitty verse that's right there at the end of chapter 9. Jesus sends the disciples into Samaria, into a Samaritan village, and it says, and they did not recognize Jesus. They weren't nice to them at all. And it goes on to say that James and John pulled Jesus aside at the very end of chapter 9. It says, Jesus, do you want us just to call down the fire from heaven? You know, these people, they don't treat you right. You want to, let's just kill them all and let God sort them out later. I, they weren't people that were just a little miffed with the Samaritans or a little crossways or saw things. That, they wanted the Samaritans dead. And that was the disciples. I mean, everybody's somebody's redneck, and, and the Samaritans were definitely everybody's redneck. They were the people, you could, you know, they were in a place by themselves, and you could treat them any way you really wanted to. If, you know, did they, did, would Jesus approve if James and John called down fire from heaven and just killed them all? You know, we'd be done with them. And now the very next story Jesus tells is a story where the Samaritan is the hero. It, we read and it says that he felt compassion for him. That's a good start. That's a good start. But he didn't just feel. He just didn't think. It wasn't something that was just in his heart. He chose to go and do. He bandaged the man's wounds. He poured oil and wine on his sores. He, he put bandages on the man. He brought him to the inn. And he paid for what the man needed. This is definitely not an attitude that says, what's yours is mine if I can take it. It's not the attitude that says, what's mine is mine and I intend to keep it. It's the attitude that says, what's mine is yours because you need it. What's mine is yours because you need it. Bobby was 12 years old when he heard the words, I love you for the first time. Bobby's mother was only 15 years old when Bobby was born. She spent most of her life in CD bars and flop houses. And she left Bobby and the other children to pretty much raise themselves. Bobby was the oldest and so he did the best he could looking after his brothers and sisters. When Department of Family and Children's Services arrived, they were living off ketchup sandwiches, living in filth and squalor. All the children were broken up and sent to, to different foster care. And it wasn't until Bobby was 12 that he was placed in the care of Arnold and Mary Peterson. He was 12 years old. Mary put her arms around Bobby and said, Bobby, I love you. It was the first time that he ever heard those words. The authorities told him that, that not to take Bobby, that Bobby was damaged goods. He was beyond help. Arnold and Mary didn't believe it at all. They began to love Bobby in the way that they were loved when they grew up. Well, little by little, Bobby began to see, see things in a different way. And I say little by little because it was when Bobby was in college that he heard a college chaplain say that God has chosen us to be a part of his family. Well, Bobby knew what it was like to be chosen to be a part of a family. The deepest desire of his heart was to belong, and, and that's what Mary and Arnold had provided him, a place to belong. And, and as the chaplain told him that, that God chose Bobby to be a part of his family, Bobby wanted to receive Jesus to be the leader of his life, to be the Lord of his life. And then his life really began to change. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. That Jesus provided a, a place 
a place to make us right with God. That on the cross, he took all those things that would separate us from God. He took the sin, he took the shame, he took the fear. All those things that would separate us from God and he nailed them to the cross to take away their power once and for all, for you and for me, to make us right with God. And when he rose from the grave, he, gro- he rose to give that power to you and to me, the power over sin, and fear, shame, and guilt. That that forgiveness... Yes, it's a forgiveness of, of all that's passed, all that's done, all that maybe was done to us. It's, it's forgiveness right now, today. And it's forgiveness for all those things that will be. The sin, the shame, the fear. And he rose to give us power over those things. And when Bobby realized that, his life began to change. And he went from being called Bobby to being called Dr. Robert Peterson. And a little while later, he began to be called pastor. And after that, author. And then years later, president of Master Media International. He was Dr. Robert Peterson. Jesus had changed Bobby's life. And Jesus still changes lives today. And he uses the church to do it. The church to do it. The church isn't someone else. The church is you and me. That that's that's who Jesus uses to change the world today. To let people know that they belong. To let people know that they matter to God and that they matter to to us. Every week here in worship, we show a compassion and community video. It's just a short snippet to show evidence of God in people's lives, everyday people's lives, that, well, they live right here. Showed one today. And there's evidence how God changes lives still today. Children, youth, adults. As a matter of fact, so far this year, 55 young people have made a first-time commitment to Jesus Christ. Here in this church, in one of, our, one of our retreats. But it's not just that. Every week, 250 families are fed right here at this church. They're given groceries Groceries in a hard and difficult economic time that through our program, My Neighbor's Pantry, we partnership with Must Ministries. And once a week, 250 families come by and get groceries to fight, to help them fight against the cost of inflation, the rising cost of food. It's not only those 250 families that we've partnered with elementary schools and high schools that people here in this church help tutor children who have who speak English as a second language those who are elementary and high school students job networking every month we we invite people to come from from all over all over that we can help them find a job a little while back I was at Home Depot I was checking out struck up a conversation with a woman there at the at the register it was a slow day and I invited her to come to the church and she said I know that church you gave me clothes for a job interview. <laughs> then she turned to the fellow next to her and said, you need to go to his church. They, they help people find jobs. It's a part of what we go and what we do. Here in the next few days, you'll be receiving a, a letter from the church. And it explains about uh, the Commons Project. 
It's a place right here on campus. Lots of grass and space. A space for community and faith. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a space, it's a place, yes, that a door is open to the church. But it's also a door that reaches out to a community that needs to know they matter to God, so, so they matter to us. It provides a, a space, a space where people might grow in that relationship with Jesus Christ. Space, space that's needed for larger groups, for support groups. Space, and a place that's set aside that says, yes, Christ has led us safe thus far, and it's Jesus Christ who will lead us home. That God's not asleep. He's not asleep here, and, and we continue to reach out beyond this place to, to places like Peru, to Honduras, to provide medicine and food to Venezuela, to Kenya. We've helped start a, a place called Divine Providence in Kenya that, that helps teach pastors that can go out all over the country and let them know the life that Jesus gives. It's what we do together that we go and we do. This morning... Church, I want to invite you to be the church. I want to invite you, not just to say what's mine is mine and I intend to keep it, but I invite you to open your hearts and open your hands and to reach out into a world that needs to know who Jesus is, longing to know who Jesus is, longing to be a part of his family, to find a place to belong, well, that's you and me. That's you and me as we, we go and do together. Pray with me. Jesus, you use the most ordinary people to do your most extraordinary work. Well, and that, those ordinary people, it's not somebody else, it's us. Use us. Use us to give, to give of our lives, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, to love you and to love neighbor. That we might, as a church, say what's mine is yours because you need it. Lord, it doesn't come easy. It doesn't come natural. Is it the most natural thing in the world? Well, it's, it's to take and to grab to say that what's yours is mine if I can take it. Or it's to say what's mine is mine and I intend to keep it. But Lord, breathe the power of your Holy Spirit on us today to get those eyes that see and those hands that give. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, 
And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.